That means videos. The Elemental Turner. Earth, air, fire, water. The English genius united them in paintings that hinted at of the chaos of creation. If England has produced a single genius among its many painters of talent, intelligence, and originality, the genius is Joseph Mallard William Turner. Alone among English painters, Turner had exceptional natural capacity for creative and original conceptions, the dictionary's definition of a genius, to a degree that it is inexplicable that can only be accepted as a general independent phenomenon, self-generated and self-sustaining. The extent of Turner's originality has been revealed only gradually by the series of aesthetic revolutions that have transformed our way of looking at art since his death in 1851. His long career carried him from realistic beginnings to an abstract conclusion, which is also the history of modern art itself. The Impressionists were the first painters to discover that Turner had anticipated them. His water watercolors have been compared to Cezanne's. The Cubists, it must be admitted, have been unable to tie their art to his, but the abstract expressionists and action painters of the 1950s and the new colorists of the 1960s have claimed him not only as an ancestor, but even more enthusiastically as a colleague. And yet during the second half of the 19th century and the first part of this one, Turner's art had very little direct influence on the various painters or schools who seemed to be descended from him. He has been discovered after the fact of revolutions rather than as a point of departure. The late sketches in which his originality seems most emphatically declared were not exhibited at all until 1906 and not in any quantity until 1938. After that, Turner's official canonization had to wait another 28 years until 1966. The Museum of Modern Art in New York exhibited them, not as a 19th century romantic, which he was, but as a 20th century ab abstractionist, which can be made to seem by selecting certain bits and pieces of his work and thereby reducing the tremendous field of his art to the dimensions. Uh, in this photograph, a yacht approaching the coast at left, one of Turner's late oil sketches, was painted for his own enjoyment and was not exhibited in his lifetime. It is an example of the style admired today for its similarities to contemporary abstraction. And it really is a great picture. Um, one of this uh, picture of uh, Turner's. One second. It's a fantastic boat. Looks kind of like all hazy with all the mist and everything. Yacht approaching the coast, yes. His field was the universe, and in discovering it, he reversed the biblical process of its creation. As a young artist, he saw the world as the comfortably inhabited landscape of England. He he saw the young... Wait, as his field of... Ah, his field was the universe, and in discovering it, he reversed the biblical process of creation. As a young artist, he saw the world as the comfortably inhabited landscape of England, but as an old man, he painted it as if it was a spectacle of the four elements of air, fire, and water fused and spin around, spun around a vor spin around a vortex, which all solid forms have dissolved, but which could also serve as the primordial womb of force from which the earth was born. Whatever he understood of theory, or more accurately, whatever he applied was negligible in the achievement of his ultimate expression. For every passage in his work that seems to conform to a theory, there are hundreds that contradict it. He was an empiricist who fulfilled his genius over a, over a long route which covered inch by experimental inch. Turner was a competent artist in his early teens, a successful one in his twenties, a great one in middle age, and then a very great one until a brief decline just before his death at the age of 76. We have become so accustomed to thinking of him in terms of modernism that it is always surprising to remember that he grew up in the 18th century. He was born in 1775 in Maiden Lane, where his father was a barber and wig maker. If he was not born holding a pencil, he must have soon learned. By the time he was 12, he was already sufficiently conscious of his identity as an artist to be signing and dating paintings, some not very impressive, and some uh, drawings, that is, some very not very dating, some very not impressive topographical drawings, probably not very impressive topographical drawings, probably copies, although they were done in the country where his parents had sent him at the age of 10 to live 
with an uncle. This signing and dating at such an early age can be recognized without too much romanticizing as the germ of Turner's feeling and maturity that his work was a unit. If some of it had to be separated from the rest by sales to make money, which he loved, he refused to sell at any price the paintings he considered his best. When he died, he left the contents of his studio, some 350 paintings, more than half of them unfinished, and 19,000 drawings to the nation. Anyone who has visited the Turner rooms in the London museums knows that Turner was right. Whatever the beauty and power of his individual paintings may be, their effect as a single revelation is overwhelming. A similar display by, by most artists, even the great ones, would only would be only encyclopedic and exhausting. At 14, Turner was admitted on probation as a student in the Royal Academy schools and returned to live with his parents in London. At about the same time, he received some instruction from one Thomas Malton, a topographical watercolorist who is chiefly remembered because he is supposed to have advised Turner's fathers to teach the unpromising boy some useful trade, such as that of a tinker or a cobbler. At 15, Turner had a watercolor in the Royal Academy exhibition. For the next 60 years, he was always represented there, except when occasionally he chose not to exhibit. At 17, he was supporting himself by coloring prints for engravers. At 18, he set himself up in his own studio. At 19, he was still working at copying other men's drawings, though in the same year, one of his own drawings was published as an engraving, which meant that he had been accepted in a field that could be the source of a major income for an artist and was for him for the rest of his life. By the time he was 20, Turner was well established among print sellers and making money and was conspicuous enough to be mentioned for the first time of many in the gossipy diary of Joseph Farrington, who lived from 1747, 1747 to 1812. He, a landscape painter whose daily jottings are a standard chronicle of the London art scene of the period. When he was 21, Turner exhibited his first oil at the Royal Academy and uh, and in the last year of the century, when he was 24, he was elected to the Academy as an associate member at the earliest age permitted. By hindsight, we can recognize that the Turner-to-be was nascent in the early oils exhibited at the Academy. On the surface, these followed closely enough the subject matter that landscape painters found popular and saleable scenic spots of local interest, frequently with the ruins that were so romantically appealing to the tourists. To tourists. But a picture of Dunstanburg Castle, Dunst Dunstanburg Castle, see page 94, is subtitled Sunrise After a Squally Night and is the real subject. Likewise, a view of Millbank, page 94, is only secondarily, secondarily topo topographical. The scene is one huge receptacle for moonlight. Morning amongst the Coniston Fells was accompanied by the Academy Catalog by lines from Milton's Paradise Lost Beginnings, ye mists and exul exultation, exul exultations, and these rise in the distance, and effect of nature that one day would engulf entire canvases in chromatic fantasies, and lead Constable to say, half ridiculing and half admiring, that Turner painted with tinted steam. The most revealing of the literary quotations that Turner chose for the catalogues at this time accompanied a painting of Buttermere Lake, See page 94 in the exhibition of 1798. Till in the western sky the downward sun looks out effulgent, the rapid radiance instantaneous strikes, the illumined mountain in a yellow mist bestriding earth, the grand ethereal bow shoots up immense and every hue unfolds. And every hue is a prophecy of Turner's development, just as the yellow mist forecasts a passion for that color so great that in his old age Turner was caricatured as a short squat figure, his oversized head bearing a great handsome beak of a nose, with a bucket of yellow paint and a mop, swabbing away at a large canvas. Turner had borrowed the lines accompanying Buttermere Lake from James Thomas's The Seasons, seventy years after they were written, but as a description of, of a Turner painting, they might have been even more appropriate in another forty years, when Turner had discovered the miracle of the Mediterranean night and the technical means of apotheosizing it in painting, and the technical means of apotheosizing it in painting, light, and by then he had become, for, for him, the ultimate dynamic force, the abstraction of what Thomas had thought of as the heart of nature. 
Turner had also discovered Sarah Danby, the widow of the composer and organist, and had begun an affair with her about 1798, the same year as the exhibition of Buttermere Lake. The affair lasted at least ten years and produced two daughters to add to the three Sarah had already borne her husband before she became a widow. Uh, yeah. um, Madding, Maddingly little is known about Sarah Danby. But since one of her legitimate daughters married a composer and organist of respectable standing, and since one of Turner's daughters, Evelina, married a respectable consular official, official, con consular official, Sarah must be imagined as a woman who maintained a respectable position of her own. That the youthful Turner was a combination of lover and protege to this cultivated woman is entirely without foundation, but it seems likely all the same. The picture of this ill-educated young man poring over Milton and Thomas, Tom Thompson, and as it turned out, making his own efforts at versification, possessed of a charming mistress, and having brought himself by the age of twenty-five to a position of prominence in his own terms against the grain of the snobbish competitive art world, is an impressive and happy is an impressive and happy one. But it is given a different cast by a fact of Turner's life that must have been of central importance both then and for the rest of his life. His election to the Royal Academy of Professional Triumph coincided with a personal tragedy, his mother's final reduction to a hopeless, to hopeless insanity. In 1800, she was admitted to Bethlehem Hospital, and when she was discharged as incurable the following year, she was put into a private asylum where she died three years later. Turner left virtually no autobiographical comments and the inadequate record of his contemporaries sound as if they were unaware of his mother's madness but certainly it was not something that Turner accepted easily. Rather, it might have explained why, in spite of his strong sexuality, he never married, why, in spite of his success, he felt a basic insecurity that led him to grasp sources of income that he did not need and to hoard money, why, in spite of very few, why, in spite of very few close friendships, he remained such a loner in society, or he could have been a lion. Soon after, Turner's mother was committed to uh, Bethlehem, his Bethlehem Saint Asylum, his father closed the barber shop and moved in with his son as a general handyman for the house. Turner was utterly without social ambitions. He and his father lived simply, almost roughly, without any interest in the appurtenant, pertinent luxuries, the appurtenant luxuries of the successful Londoner, the fine furniture, the silver, the servants, the parties, but whatever else they had in common, they shared a love of money for its own sake with nothing, which is usually enough among poor people to have begun to earn large sums. The two Turners developed a reputation for being misers, and there were stories about the shabbiness and squalor in which they lived. But the tolerance of primitive domesticity can be explained as a natural indifference on Turner to the part of the vanities that would only complicate his life by taking more time and always more money than they were ever worth. Turner was simply too busy to bother. When he was 27, Turner was elected to the full membership of the Royal Academy, he could sell anything he wanted to, and seeing no point in working through intermediaries. In 1804, he opened his gallery in Hartley Street, where he kept 20 to 30 works on an exhibition. He also moved into a better house, although not a better kept one, in Upper Mall, Hammersmith. Within a few years, in 1810, he took a large house in Queens, on Queen Anne Street, which he eventually remodeled to include his gallery sales room. He was constantly busy and constantly successful, but he was also constantly looking for something that eluded him as an artist. He traveled incessantly looking for it, seeming not to know quite what it was, except that the peaceful English countryside did not offer it to him. 